Hello Year 6 and welcome back to Lesson 7 of our Destination Reader Sessions where we are reading Kensuke's Kingdom by Michael Merpurgo. As always, throughout today's lesson, keywords which I'd like you to focus on will be in red. These may be vocabulary words or sentence stems from your strategy prompt sheet. Any questions for you to answer will be in blue and any time I'd like you to pause the video and write down your ideas, that will be found in green. Before we begin, let's make sure we're all ready to learn. You will need a copy of the story, Kensuke's Kingdom by Michael Morpurgo, a strategy prompt sheet, as well as a pencil and a piece of paper, or something to write on. If you don't have these things, please pause the video here and come back when you are ready. Let's get going. Let's remember that we're reading Kensuke's Kingdom by Michael Merpurgo. So far in our story, Michael and his mum and dad and dog Stella have decided to take a trip around the world on their new boat, the Peggy Sue. In chapters 2 and 3 so far, we've learned a bit about what life was like on the Peggy Sue. And in chapter 3, we've been reading entries from Michael's ship's log. Today, we'll continue with that chapter. Before we begin reading, let's take a few moments to think about our reading strategy focus today. Today's reading strategy is inference. Now year six, the question I know you all love. What do good readers use to make inferences? Pause the video here and write down those two things. Great job. Let's see. Oh, well done, Year 6. You are correct. Good readers use clues from the text and background knowledge to make inferences. Let's have a practice making inferences from a picture before we begin reading. My question to you about this image is, is this image close to the surface? I want you to think about what clue from the image you used and what background knowledge you used to answer this question. Pause the video here and have a go writing this down. Great work. Let's see what I did. I've said, no, I don't think this image is close to the surface. That's my answer. Now, the clues that I used were the sunken ship. My background knowledge is that sunken ships are found at the bottom of the ocean. Now I wonder, Year 6, did any of you say yes? Great job, some of you did. You could have said yes. If you said, yes, this image is from close to the surface, your clue would have been the sunlight coming through. Your background knowledge would be that you know in water, we can only see that sunlight when we're close to the surface. Great job. Now let's get to our story. Let's bust out a few vocabulary words before we begin. Our first word today is an adjective. Year six, please remind me, what is an adjective? Great job, an adjective is a describing word. It is a word that tells me something about a noun. Our first word today is manky. Manky. Good job. The word manky means dirty or unpleasant. And in today's reading, that word manky is used to describe the Peggy Sue. Our next vocabulary word is a noun. It's a thing. The word is stores. Stores. Great job. In today's reading, when we say stores, we are not talking about shops. What we're talking about is a supply of something kept for use when needed. So in our story, Michael will talk about the stores on the Peggy Sue. That means their supplies of food and other things that they need to survive. Our third word today is current current. Well done. A current is also a noun. It's a thing in the ocean. 
It is the directed movement of seawater caused by the force of wind, waves, and temperature. And finally, our f fourth vocabulary word is rollicking. Rollicking. A rollicking is a severe reprimand. It's somewhat like a telling off. So if you get a rollicking, you've just gotten a telling off. Very quickly, Year 6, let's talk about the types of questions we'll see in today's lesson. We will see both one and two mark questions. One mark questions need a short, snappy answer. Your turn. Great work. Two mark questions need a PE answer. Your turn. Great job. All right, let's continue reading with chapter three, Ship's Log. We're going to begin on page 31. I'll give you a few moments to get there and get ready. Great work. Let's get started. December 25th. Christmas Day at sea. Dad found some carols on the radio. We had crackers. All of them a bit soggy, so none of them cracked. And we had the Christmas pudding Gran made for us. I gave them a drawing each, my flying fish for Dad, and one of the skipper in her hat at the wheel for Mum. They gave me a really neat knife they'd bought in Rio. So I gave a coin back. You're supposed to do that. It's for luck. Our first question today, Year 6 is did Christmas feel like Christmas for Michael and his family? This is a two-mark question, so I'd like you to tell me whether or not you think it felt like Christmas and then support your answer with evidence. Pause the video here and have a go at your answer. Great job. Let's take a look at my answer. I said I think Christmas felt mostly like Christmas for Michael and his family because, and here's my evidence, I've given you more than one thing here. Because one, they exchanged gifts, two, they ate traditional Christmas food, and three, they sang Christmas carols. Let's keep reading. When we were in Rio, we gave the Peggy Sue a good scrub down. She was looking a bit manky inside and outside, but she's not anymore. We took on a lot of stores and water for the long haul to South Africa. Mum says we're doing fine, just so long as we keep south, so long as we stay in the west to east South Atlantic current. We passed south of an island called, called St. Helena a few days ago. No need to stop. Nothing much there, except it's the place where Napoleon was exiled. He died there lonely place to die. So, of course, I had to do a history project on Napoleon. I had to look him up in the encyclopedia and write about him. It was quite interesting, really, but I didn't tell them that. Let's pause there. This is a one-mark question, so remember, you just need a short, snappy answer. Why didn't Michael tell his mum and dad that he found his project about Napoleon interesting? Pause the video here, have a think, and write down your short, snappy answer. Great work, well done. I said Michael didn't tell his mum and dad that he found this project interesting because he didn't want to do homework. If he told them it was interesting, they might make him do more, and that would be horrible. Let's keep reading. We are at the top of page 33, beginning with the paragraph, Stella's sulking in my bunk. Maybe it's because no one gave her a Christmas present. I offered her a taste of Grand's Christmas pudding, but she hardly gave it a sniff. Can't say I blame her. All right, let's stop there. Let's have a think. How does Michael feel about Grand's Christmas pudding? Hmm. This is a two-mark question, so let's remember that you need to tell me how Michael feels 
and give me evidence from the text to support your answer. Pause the video here and have a go. Well done. Let's take a look at what I said. I said, I think Michael does not like Grand's pudding. That's my first mark. I told you he feels not good about it. He doesn't like it. Now I'm going to give you evidence to get my second mark. Because, he says, I can't blame her when Stella didn't want any of it. This makes me think Michael also didn't really want any of the Christmas pudding. Great job. Let's keep reading. We're on page 33, about one quarter of the way down the page. Beginning with the paragraph, I saw a sail today. I saw a sail today. Another yacht. We shouted Happy Christmas and waved. Stella barked her head off, but they were too far away. When the sail disappeared, the sea felt suddenly very empty. Mum won the chest this evening. She's ahead now. Twenty-one games to twenty. Dad said he'd let her win, because it was Christmas. They joke about it, but they both want to win. January 1st, 1989. Africa again. Cape Town. Table Mountain. And this time we're not just sailing by. We're going to put in there. They told me this evening. They didn't want to tell me before, in case we couldn't afford it. But we can. We're going to stay for a couple of weeks, maybe more. We're going to see elephants and lions in the wild. I can't believe it. I don't think they can either. When they told me, they were like a couple of kids, all laughing and happy. They were never like this at home. These days, they really smile at each other. Let's stop there. I wonder, nowhere here has the author told us how Michael and his family are feeling about stopping at Cape Town. So I'd like you to decide how were Michael and his family feeling about stopping at Cape Town and how do you know? Pause the video here to write down your two mark answer. Great job. Let's see my answer. I said, I think these characters were feeling excited. That's my first mark, the feeling. Now I give you some evidence from the text to support my answer. I know this because Michael said, I can't believe it. And his parents were laughing and happy like a couple of kids. This suggests that they're excited. Let's continue reading. We're at the top of page 34. Beginning the paragraph, Mum's getting stomach cramps. Mum's getting stomach cramps. Dad wants her to see a doctor in Cape Town, but she won't. I reckon it's the baked beans. The good news is the baked beans have at last run out. The bad news is we had sardines for supper. Ick! February 7th. We're hundreds of miles out in the Indian Ocean. And then this happens. Stella hardly ever comes up on deck unless it's flat calm. I don't know why she came up. I don't know why she was there. We were all busy, I suppose. Dad was brewing up down in the galley, and Mum was at the wheel. I was doing one of my navigation lessons, taking bearings with the sextant. The Peggy Sue was pitching and rolling a bit. I had to steady myself. I looked up and I saw Stella up at the bow of the boat. One moment she was just standing there. The next she was gone. We had practiced the man overboard drill dozens of times back at the solent with Barnacle Bill. Shout and point. Keep shouting, keep pointing. Turn into the wind. Get the sails down quick. Engine on. By the time Dad had the mainsail and the jib down, we were already heading back towards her. I was doing the pointing and the shouting too. She was paddling for her life in the green of a looming wave. Dad was leaning over the side and reaching for her. But he didn't have a safety harness on, and Mum was going mad. She was trying to bring the boat in as close and as slow as she could. But a wave took Stella away from us at the last moment. We had to turn and come back again. All the time I was pointing and shouting. 
Three times we came in, but each time we passed her by. Either we were going too fast or she was out of reach. She was weak by now. She was hardly paddling. She was going under. We had one last chance. We came in again, perfectly this time, and close enough for Dad to be able to reach out and grab her. Between the three of us, we managed to haul Stella back into the boat by her collar, by her tail. I got a well done monkey face from Dad, and Dad got a huge rollicking from Mum for not wearing his safety harness. Dad just put his arms around her, and she cried. Stella shook herself and went below as if nothing at all had happened. Let's stop there. Year six, how many of you have goosebumps from that scene? I do. I was so nervous that something bad was going to happen to Stella, like they weren't going to be able to get her. Whew! I'm glad they did. Let's have a think. I wonder, why did Mum hug Dad and cry after this incident with Stella? How was Mum feeling? And how do you know? Pause the video here and have a go at answering this question on your own. Great job. Let's take a look at my answer. I said, I think mom hugged dad and cried because she's relieved. I know this because the incident sounded extremely scary. So I know everyone on the boat felt scared while it was happening. But after they got Stella back, they were relieved. Now year six, let's notice here that I didn't use evidence directly from the text. What I did do was I explained how I knew using things that happened. Even if I don't use the exact words from the text, using events that happened is still using evidence. Let's finish off this entry into Michael's ship log. We are at the bottom of page 36. Mum has made a strict rule. Stella Artois is never to go out on deck, whatever the weather, without a safety harness clipped on, like the rest of us. Dad's going to make one for her. I still dream of elephants in South Africa. I loved how slow they are and thoughtful. I loved their wise, weepy eyes. I can still see their snooty giraffes looking down at me and the lion cub sleeping with his mother's tail in his mouth. I did lots of drawings, and I keep looking at them to remind me. The sun in Africa is so big, so red. Australia next. Kangaroos and possums and wombats. Uncle John's going to meet us in Perth. I've seen photos of him, but I've never met him. Dad says this evening he's only a distant uncle. Very distant, Mum said, and they both laughed. I didn't get the joke till I thought about it again when I came on watch. The stars were so bright, and Stella was saved. I think I'm happier than I have been all my life. And that's where we're going to stop today. What I'd like you to do now is make a prediction about what you think will happen next in the book. Great job today, Year 6, and tomorrow we'll continue reading. See you then!